OK, so now that we've got the basic idea of what a limit is, I get to make a couple of obvious points, and we get to talk about some of the laws of limits and how to find them algebraically. I will make two semi-obvious points. The limit as x approaches c of x, and also the limit as x approaches c, where c is just any number, of some constant function k. k is a number. Uh, in the case on the left, uh, I'm graphing the function y equals x. There is some point c on the horizontal axis. I want to know what y value I approach as I approach that x value. Well, we know that the x values and the y values are the same, so whatever this is, this is, and it's a nice continuous function, so as as x approaches c, x approaches c. And in this case, we have some constant function, k for constant. That's the y value of k. I've got some x value called c. And oh look, as x gets closer and closer to c, x gets closer and closer to c, the y values get closer and closer to k. Those are some obvious things. But there are some other laws that can be proven uh, in a course that's more rigorous with its analysis, but we're not looking to be that rigorous, so you just have to know how they play. If I add two functions together, and, oh, the ground rules for this, the ground rules for this are that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is some number l, and the limit as x approaches c of g of x is some other number m. So if we were to add those functions together and approach c, well, this function contributes this to the oh, this to the y values, and this function contributes this to the y values. We just add those limits. Same thing holds true if we subtract two functions. Um, what happens if we do a vertical stretch? If we do a vertical stretch, then all of the y values get stretched out by a factor of k. So this y value gets stretched out by a factor of k. Uh, what happens if we multiply two functions? If we multiply two functions, then, well, it would stand to reason that their limits also multiply, and they do also holds for division. And then what happens if we raise f of x to a power? Well, as an extension of this rule, its limit gets raised to that same power. And so when we take a look at something like this, When we're looking to see, as x gets closer and closer to 5, what is happening to th this function? Well, we could break it down, and we could say, well, this is x. x is getting closer and closer to 5. That gets cubed, so that's, that's 5 cubed. Uh, this is a vertical stretch of that function. x is getting closer and closer to 5, so this is getting closer and closer to 2 times 5, and then we're subtracting two functions, so boom, and that's 115. Now, you're sitting there watching this video saying, wait a second, couldn't we have just substituted that 5 in and gotten the job done? And the answer is yes. Because this function is continuous, as we will learn soon enough, sure, you just shove that 5 in and you're good to go. In fact, x to the 4th plus 1 over x cubed plus 14. If I want to know what that limit is, I just take that 3 and substitute, and I get 82 over 41, and that's 2. In cases where you can just substitute, finding limits is very easy. But finding limits is not always easy. What if, oh,
One moment, please. Sorry about that. x squared minus 2x minus 8 over x minus 4. And you say to yourself, okay, I'll just sub in the 4. Uh-oh, the denominator is 0. Uh-oh, the numerator is 0. That's a problem. 0 over 0 is a very weird thing. Like, how do we handle that? Well, we handle that by saying, I know how to factor. And I can factor that numerator. I know that that negative 8 is probably going to give me a negative 4 and a positive 2. A couple of x's there for window dressing. And these drop out. And so the limit of this is the same as the limit of this. And that's much easier to deal with. 4 goes in there. 4 plus 2 is 6. Now, mind you, uh, we can cancel because this factor never actually becomes 0. Remember, x gets closer and closer to 4, but it doesn't hit 4. And so the denominator is never really 0, and so we can cancel out non-zero factors. Well, as luck would have it, there are other kinds of problems. And you say to yourself, whoa, this is a problem. And this is a problem because I can sub in 2 there and realize the denominator goes to 0. And I can sub 2 in there and realize the numerator goes to 0. But I can't factor that. And in this case, something comes to the rescue that hasn't come to the rescue for us in a long time. Uh, you remember when you were in high school and you had a radical and the radical was causing trouble. Well, how did we fix things? We multiplied and divided by what was called the conjugate. This was something that got us out of trouble when we were trying to rationalize denominators and there were radicals involved. Uh, we're multiplying by 1 here, so there's no issue. But look what happens. Your denominator, we're going to leave exactly the way it is. But the numerator, x plus 7, well, that's x plus 7. Negative, positive, those drop out, minus 9. Well, looky there. This is x minus 2, and this is x minus 2. And so what I'm left with, what I'm left with is 1 over 3 plus 3 is 6. Now that's a very interesting find. And in fact, I'll go one more. We'll talk about the limit as x approaches 5 of 3 over x plus 1 minus 1 half over x minus 5. And it doesn't take you long to figure out that this is another 0 over 0 situation, 3 sixths minus 1 half over 5 minus 5. And so we think to ourselves, what algebraic tools do we have at our disposal to get us out of trouble here? We can get out of trouble here by using a least common denominator. And the least common denominator is 2 times x plus 1. Your denominator is 2 times x minus 5 times x plus 1. Your numerator, let's see, this x plus 1 is going to cancel out with that, leave you with 3 times 2. This 2 is going to cancel out with that 2, leave you with negative x plus 1. Well, what have I got up top? I've got 5 minus x. And that's x minus 5. So the x minus 5 and the 5 minus x leave you with a negative 1 factor. And so I've got negative 1 over, sub in the 5, 2 times 6, and that's negative 1 twelfth. So there are ways that we can find limits graphically, if we have the graph available, but also algebraically, if we don't have the graph available. Hey, one more thing. Um, one more thing in this screencast. I want to look at the squeeze theorem, uh, which is also called the sandwich theorem. And I want to look at it in a very, uh, very real context. I want to take a look at the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times the sine of 1 over x. I want to take a look at that. 
Now, let's bring our calculator back in. And let's get rid of this thing. And let's do x squared times the sine of 1 over x and see what happens. And, oh, wow, let's do a standard zoom on this thing. Let's do a trig zoom on this. Oh, that's not going to help, is it? Nope, it doesn't help. I'll just zoom in where I'm looking. It would appear that that function is getting closer and closer to zero, would it not? Great. But the question is, how do you prove that? How do you prove that? Because as x is getting closer and closer to zero, this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I don't know what happens to sine when it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, I'm going to say that everybody understands that the sine of 1 over x is between negative 1 and 1, right? Everybody understands that. And so everybody understands that the sine of an angle is trapped between negative 1 and 1. That's our starting place. So if that's true, then I can multiply everybody through by x squared, and I can know that negative x squared is less than or equal to this thing that we're interested in, which is less than or equal to x squared. Okay, all I've done is multiply through by x squared. So here's the question. What happens to this? What happens to this as x gets closer and closer to 0? Those y values get closer and closer to 0. And as x gets closer and closer to 0, this gets closer and closer to 0. So here's my question. If this is trapped between those two things, and this gets closer and closer to 0, and this gets closer and closer to 0, guess what happens to that? Right. It gets closer and closer to 0. In a more general way, if I have three functions, if I have some h of x, and I have some g of x, and I know that f of x is trapped between h of x and g of x. It lives somewhere in here. If h goes to l as x approaches c, and g goes to l as x approaches c, then f, no matter where it lives and what it tries to do, is going to have to go to l as x approaches c. That's the idea behind the sandwich theorem, or the squeeze theorem. Okay, this went a little bit longer than I imagined that it would. Uh, one left to do in this preparation uh, for our next time in class, and that'll be about delta epsilon definitions. Okay, thanks everybody.